So now that we know a little bit more about unit conversions and how that applies to us in a laboratory setting, we can take that knowledge and apply it to making buffer stock solutions. But before we get started, I don't know about you, but all this talking is making me a little bit thirsty. So we're going to get started with a little bit of an example. So I have here my absolute favorite mug I like to drink all of my root beer from, but today I don't have any root beer. I have this handy dandy great value fruit punch mix that we're going to use to demonstrate how stock solutions work. So according to the directions of this five calorie packet, we are going to use 16.9 fluid ounces, which is exactly what this mug is, for one packet one packet of drink mix. So hold on one second, I'm gonna mix this guy in there. Used to live off these things when I was younger, and I still do, even in college. Okay, now I'm gonna use my stirring rod to mix this up. So this is perfect. This is what we would call a 1x solution. We are not concentrating this in any way, shape, or form. It's exactly as it was intended to be produced, uh, um, or exactly how it's supposed to look um, according to the directions. I followed the directions and everything is perfect. So I could drink this as is, or if I wanted to get fancy, or if I was really, really in the mood for some extra sugar, I could open up a second packet that opens up, there we go, to make what we would call a 2x solution. So we're gonna do that today because I need the energy. Alrighty, now I'm gonna mix this guy in here. It's not an exact science, but it's close enough. Alrighty. So if we take a sip of this, it is way too sugary. I have a problem. I have way too much concentration in this mug. So the way I'm going to solve this is through making a um, stock. I'm going to dilute it. So today um, in our presentation and in our um, notes, we're going to learn a little bit more about how stock solutions work and how we dilute them. So um, to get started for this example, note that I have enough powder in here to make 32 ounces. That's 32 ounces of fruit punch. And this is only 16 ounces. So how I'm going to solve that is by pouring some of this excess saturated 2x solution into its own cup. Oops. Hold on one second. So I poured about half of it out. Now I have some water over here. I'm going to pour it on in here and into my other cup. This for good measure. And now if I mix it up, much better. We took a solution that was 2x, added some water, and then diluted it so that it was back to its normal state of 1x. So today we're going to learn a little bit more about stock solutions and apply this example to a more relevant example that we might see in our lab. So just for um, illustration purposes, we should know what a stock solution actually is by definition. So what I want you guys to capture down is a stock solution is a concentration or is a concentrated, there we go, substance we can store and later dilute for use in the lab. So that is what a stock solution boils down to. So in our example today, I had some really, really concentrated stock solution or Kool-Aid that I then was able to dilute using some water to make for a nice, tasty, refreshing beverage for use for today. So. Why do we create stock solution in the first place? That is a good question. That's what we're going to get to next. So on question number two in your guide, creating stock solution allows us to save space, time, and effort. Okay, now would be a good time for you to pause this video and ponder on why these three elements are important in a lab and how stock solutions can help save space, time, and effort. So I'll give you a second to think about that. 
All right, so now that you've had some time to think about that and how space, time, and effort play a role in the laboratory and how stock solutions can help, um, let's jot that down in your, your notes. So space. If we had all of this Kool-Aid um, in a super, really, really high concentrated solution, um, we then save so much space because we wouldn't have as much water or packets laying around. So we save tons of space. We save time because then we're going to be able to um, more efficiently go into the lab, grab what we need, and then just dilute as we need to. And also time and effort kind of go hand in hand. We're going to save so much effort if we make a lot of stock solution today and then we can utilize it for the rest of um, the semester or year or however um, long we may need to have that solution. So when we label stock solutions in the lab, we're going to need to include three important things. Our name, so we know who made the stock solution, the date the solution was prepared, and of course, content and concentration. So we might label this as like, I was making some TBE solution. I can name it Joe R A M S T A D. I prepared it today, so October 15, 2017, and we'll call it 3x TBE buffer. So I would put this on my tube, and then we could utilize it in the lab and know exactly when it was prepared, who made it, and what the heck is inside. So always remember those three key things when we're making stock solutions in the laboratory environment. So um, I kind of want to give you guys a little bit of an example before we go any further with this whole dilution and stock solution thing. So hopefully you guys capture all of this down. I'm going to take my handy dandy little paper towel and wipe everything down. All righty. So if we go to the calculation side for this video, um, question number one is just a review. So assume that we have 100 milliliters of blue food coloring in a well, okay? And we want to dilute this with yellow food coloring to yield 692 milliliters of solution exactly. So we have question mark number of yellow food coloring to yield 692 milliliters of solution. So we have four questions that we're gonna to answer today regarding to this scenario. So number one, how much yellow food coloring is going to be needed to reach the final solution? All right, it's a pretty easy start off. So we want to end with 692 and we have 100. So 692, I'll label it, minus 100 yields 592 milliliters of yellow food coloring will be needed. Always get in the habit of labeling as well, really important. So that will be our answer to that first question. You would need 592 to yield that desired result. Number two, or letter B, what percent of the final solution will be considered yellow food coloring? So we start off with 592 milliliters of yellow food coloring, what we just found. And we can divide it by 692, which is our total, to get an 85.5% YFC value. All right, so this in chemistry class is sometimes also known as mass comp or mass composition. Um, we're not gonna get too much in detail with this, but just a fun term to know, mass comp. Um, letter C. What percent of the final solution will be blue food coloring? So again, we're going to do pretty much the same thing. Take 100 of blue food coloring divided by 692 milliliters of total volume to yield 14.5% blue food coloring. Now, you're probably thinking, why the heck did you just spend all of that extra effort rewriting that equation when you could have just subtracted from 100? It's so always a good habit to do as many calculations as possible to check your work. So if I would have gotten 23% here, 
this probably would have been wrong or I might have screwed up a little bit on this calculation, but it's important just to, just to calculate everything out just to make sure that everything matches. So 85.5 plus 14.5 does check and it is 100%. So we know that 100% of our solution is either gonna be blue or yellow food coloring. So letter D takes us back to elementary school. So what um, color is this all gonna end up being? So if I have just a little bit of blue, just a little bit, and a little bit of, or a lot of black, or what we will be yellow in this scenario, it's going to be just a darker shade or a lighter shade of yellow, so or a blue. So it's going to end up being light green in color. I feel really, really bad that I don't have colors to show this, but um, it's going to be a light green because if we have just a little bit of blue and a whole lot of yellow, um, we're not going to completely get rid of that blue color. That tint's still going to be there, but it's going to be a lot more on the yellow side than it will be on the blue side. So. Um, that was number one of your practice problems, so you can check that one off. Um, and now I want to draw your attention back to the other side with more of those video questions. So we discussed this in lab, I believe a few weeks ago, um, and what is known as the dilution equation. And whenever we use math in the lab, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing it right because one wrong number can throw everything off. So um, we're going to spend some time today practicing the dilution equation in a little bit. But just so we're all on the same page, um, we want to write out this equation. So the dilution equation is defined as M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. So that is M1 stands for the molarity or concentration of what we're starting off with, our original substance, okay? V1 is equivalent to the volume of our starting solution, so how much of the starting solution that we have. M2 is the molarity or concentration of what we want to end up with. And lastly, V2 is the volume of the solution that we want to have when everything is said and done. So beginning equals end of molarity and volume. That's a great way to remember that. So it'll give you some time just to capture this equation down and what those variables mean, or you can pause the video whenever you need to as well. So this equation is very, very important because it allows for us to calculate just how much of a concentrated substance will be needed to yield a, um, a different concentrated substance. So for example, um, we have two practice problems that are on the other side of the sheet that we're gonna work on today as well. So number two, practice. So keeping this equation in mind and knowing that we're always gonna be solving for exactly one variable, Brent needs to make 92 liters, or L, of 1x, so concentration of 1, TBE solution. If he only has 10x TBE available, he will need to dilute with distilled water. Calculate how much of the 10x TBE and distilled water he will need. So again, we start with our equation, and we got to start with what we know. So when we're working on our practicals or on our quizzes, it's a very good habit to write down all of the variables and what those correlate to. So. So we know that M1 is going to be 10 because we're starting off with 10x TBE. Volume one, shoulder shrug. We don't know that yet. So we got to put a big little question mark over there. Um, M2, molarity of our final solution. We want to reach a 1x solution. So that's going to be 1x TBE. And lastly, B2, the problem tells us that we want to create a total of 92 liters. That is a lot of solution. All right, so let's put this all together in the equation. So we got 10 times V1 equals 1 times 92. So you see where I'm getting that there? So draw that M1 of 10, V1, we don't know yet, 1 and 92. So simple math. 92 equals 10 times V1. Divide both sides by 10 to isolate or get V1 by itself. And that tells us that the volume is 9.2 liters. So that is how much of the 10x TBE 
we will need. But we're not done yet, all right? The problem wants us to tell it, or wants us to communicate to Brent how many liters of distilled water he's going to need. So we know that he wants to end up with 92 liters in the end. So if we take this, plop it out over here for step number two. We want to end with 92 liters, and we know that 9.2 of those 92 liters are going to need to be buffer. So this is going to get us 82.8 liters of distilled water. And that's what our final answer is going to be. So let's walk through this again real briefly just so we're all on the same page. We know that we want to start with 10x TBE. We don't know what our volume is going to be in the beginning. We know we want to end with 92 liters of a 1x solution. We plug everything into our dilution equation very carefully, of course. And that yields us 9.2 liters of 10x TBE. That is how much of the 10, 10x solution we are going to have to add in order to yield a 1x solution in the end of it all. Then we take 92 liters, which is how much we want to end with, and subtract by the known value of 9.2 that we just solved for to get 82.8 liters of distilled water. And that's going to be our final answer. So if you have any questions on this, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to help you with that as well. And we're going to leave... Um, this equation in our pockets because it's going to show up again later on this semester. So just know that that equation is going to be a lifesaver. And our last problem for this video is relating to agarose gel. So assume that we have 700 milliliters of TBE. How much agarose powder do we need to add to create a 1.5% agarose buffer? Again, whenever we're using powder, we can assume that we're going to be measuring in grams. So if any of you guys remember from earlier this semester, one milliliter is equal to one cc or cubic centimeter, which is equal to one gram. So here we really don't have to do too much converting, so it's very, very easy for us. This is going to be something very important to know, especially for those of you folks who are doing pre-vet or um, want to work in the medical field someday. This is a very important conversion. Pretty easy to remember, though. Um, basically, we know that we're starting off with 700 um, milliliters of TBE, and we have to add this agarose powder in order to make the gel work. So we're starting off with 700 milliliters. And we know that one milliliter is equal to one gram. So we are going to do times this by 1.5%. But one problem here, we have to convert this so it works in the equation. So 700 milliliters of TBE times 0 0.15, 0 015, excuse me. Um, something important to note is whenever we get percentages, just divide it by 100, and that'll give you the decimal that you need to get. Um, and then we're going to multiply that out and get 10.5 grams of agarose powder. So this is how much we would need to add to our TBE buffer in order to make everything work. So I think that's everything for this video. Again, feel free to let me know if you have any questions or concerns with the material. Otherwise, see you back for video three.